I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for attending our special event this afternoon on building a pathway for coordinated, affordable, employer-sponsored primary care. I'm Mark McClellan. I'm the director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, also an independent board member at Cigna and Johnson & Johnson. We're really glad to have you with us for this special event. Uh, right now, employer-sponsored health insurance continues to fall short in many ways in providing convenient health care that addresses the needs of employees and their families. Uh, costs are too high, and especially in the pandemic, health inequities have worsened, and we've fallen farther behind on primary care, effective programs to manage risk factors and keep people well, leading to a decline in our health outcomes. That affects employers, employees, everyone uh, in the United States. Despite all the recent innovations in such areas as digital care, all the biomedical progress, and all the creativity that we've seen displayed in the pandemic, Americans are simply not getting the right care put together for them to help them be as healthy as possible. Over this hour, we're going to discuss some of the important emerging opportunities and activities for employer leadership to improve the healthcare experience and the health of employees and their families through care that's built on a strong foundation of advanced primary care with the capabilities to put together the comprehensive integrated approaches to meet each person's needs. Dan Mendelson, who leads Morgan Health, and I will begin by discussing, I think we have, uh, I might have an agenda on the next slide, but if not, we can leave it on this one. Um, we'll begin by discussing a new report from the Duke Margolis Center and Morgan Health uh, that reviews where we are and where we're headed. Then we'll introduce Joanne Kennan from Politico and Liz Fowler, the director of CMMI, for a discussion around some of the major activities that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, are undertaking related to this same goal. Then we're going to bring in Elizabeth Carpenter from Avalier to talk more about the employer health reform context and some system-wide trends around advancing uh, strong coordinated care programs. During this conversation, we encourage you to participate. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A tab in Zoom. It's at the bottom of my screen, hopefully easy to find on yours. Uh, our moderator will see them. We're going to work as many of them as possible into the discussion. Today does mark the release of this new report that you're seeing on the screen. It reviews employers' experience to date with reforming care and outlines a pathway for employers to work toward more affordable, coordinated primary care by building partnerships with healthcare providers and others to deliver that care. Changing the status quo requires more than wellness programs, more than workplace clinics, more than Centers for Excellence for Specialized Care. At its core, it requires employers redefining how they contract for care through coordinated care led by primary care practices that bring together a range of advanced capabilities. You can see these on the, I think on the next slide, on the, on the next, um, uh, the next page right there in the, the middle of the screen. That's uh, advanced data analytics uh, to help customize care for individuals and bring it to them, anticipate their needs. Home and virtual care that's more, much more convenient to use. Care coordination with the needs of specialized care as well as behavioral health, mental health, and addressing uh, social factors that influence poor health outcomes. It needs to be culturally competent um, and bring together a team uh, that can efficiently address this combination of needs and includes building relationships with community organizations to improve access to, to social supports. Um, as this figure shows, success depends on employers taking a new approach uh, to transform care. So that is the first figure and the main figure in the paper that summarizes the, uh, the content there. Uh, we talk about the, the details of those, the key features of those contracts with emerging provider organizations and other collaborators who are capable of co-developing developing all of these advanced primary care and care coordination capabilities, um, but it also requires or benefits from aligning with other public and private reform initiatives, uh, the aligned uh, public and private support. Now, as Morgan Health is showing, this isn't just theory, this is being implemented now. The report highlights efforts by other employers as well, notably many of those working through the Purchaser Business Group on Health, or PG, PBGH, aiming to set up similar comprehensive approaches to reforms that meet employees where they are and that engage healthcare providers in taking on accountability for improving their overall health and experience with healthcare. Again, it's hard for employers to, emphasize, to implement these reforms alone. 
Even the biggest and most committed employers typically purchase care for only a small share of workers in any market or system. So we're at a critical time right now, not only because of the need to do better for employers, but also for all Americans. And we're gonna hear shortly from Liz Fowler about how CMMI is prioritizing many of these same goals for comprehensive care, starting with advanced accountable primary care and how the agency can potentially collaborate with employers and others to make system-wide progress. Uh, but to get this uh, going, you have to get started. And that's what Dan, Men Dan Mendelson and Morgan Health have been working on. So I wanna turn to Dan now for him to talk more about Morgan Health's priorities, the components of their upcoming partnership with Vera Whole Health to implement this kind of model. Dan? Uh, Mark, thanks so much for the, uh, for the warm introduction. And uh, thanks also to you and your team for focusing on this issue. Um, about 150 million Americans are getting their uh, insurance through their employer. And when you look at the discourse of what's happening right now, you see a lot more focus on Medicare, Medicaid, the exchanges uh, and the like, and it's understandable why, um, but we really need to focus on this part of America's healthcare system in order to achieve uh, the, the objectives that all of us have been talking about uh, for so long, uh, including accountable care. Uh, so, so it's great to see uh, your group focused on this as well as you know, potentially partnership from uh, CMMI and the like. Um, let me say a few words about Morgan Health, since we are undoubtedly the youngest organization that's being uh, represented here, um, now being about four months old. Um, so we are uh, a group that is focused on driving innovation into employer-sponsored healthcare. Uh, and we're focused both on um, the health insurance aspect as well as prevention um, that, that we will deploy uh, through, through a variety of means. And our goal is really to achieve improvements in quality, mitigation of increases in costs for our employees, and then uh, health equity, very importantly. So it's a familiar set of goals to everyone uh, on, on, the, uh, on the webinar, I know. Um, and what we're going to be doing is deploying the JPMC balance sheets. We have an initial allocation of $250 million uh, to invest in, in these uh, demonstrations and in various projects that we do. And think about us really as a private sector counterpart to CMMI. Um, our goal is to field successful models that are applicable not only to our population at JPMC, uh, but also to 150 million Americans who are uh, getting their insurance through their employer. Um, so why coordinated care? Well, we have been thinking a lot strategically about where to focus and a lot of employers understandably are focused on these point solutions, you know, more specific ways to improve um, various aspects of care. Um, but we go into this with the belief that having a really strong primary care connection point and a leveraged primary care model where it's not just a primary care physician, it's a team-based uh, approach that also deploys technology has a tremendous potential. Um, we believe in its potential in Medicare as um, I know that, that Liz will talk about uh, and we believe in its potential in the private sector. Now, the, the record, if you look at the record, it's mixed. And there are some cases where these primary care models succeed and other cases where they don't. And we've given a lot of thought to this and, and really are focused on, you know, not only the potential, but also uh, the potential pitfalls. So there are a few things that, that we think are really uh, critically important. The first is that we are gonna be fielding this model initially in Columbus, Ohio, with a really strong uh, group called Central Ohio Primary Care or COPC. Uh, and it's a group that 25% um, of our employees are already um, being cared for by, by COPC. Um, and they get very high marks and we believe in their ability to really engage and, and understand uh, these, these models as well as to move to full risk uh, by 2023, which is kind of our, our pathway uh, to risk. Um, second is that, that we really believe in a patient-centric model um, and coordinating technology and really putting the patient at the center of, of the care map. So that's going to be another, another facet of, um, of what we do. Um, we're going to get the incentives lined up right and make sure that there are financial incentives to accomplish all the objectives that we set out. So it's not only quality, it will also be health equity. And health equity is, as I mentioned, uh, at the outset, a very critical component of everything that we're doing uh, at Morgan Health. And we believe that by setting up 
um, strong incentives to achieve health equity that we can get uh, more focus on this and, and at least part way towards um, you know, that, that, uh, that objective. So those are some of the things that we're doing and I'm happy to talk in uh, more detail as we go forward. But uh, I will say that, that um, you know, we appreciate the focus on this. Um, we appreciate the fact that, that uh, there's interest in this and this model that we are pioneering uh, is really intended to be available to all employers. So it is not just something that we're fielding for uh, JP Morgan Chase. The idea is that, that it is fully available to really uh, anyone either in Columbus or in other geographies that wants to engage in it. And um, uh, we're happy to support that as well. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna close. Um, and uh, I think next up on the, um, on the agenda is uh, Joanne Keenan. Um, who is uh, senior editor at, um, at Politico, and uh, Liz Fowler, who, as all of you know, runs the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Uh, and then Mark and I will, uh, will engage after Liz has had a chance to say a few words about some of the uh, connection points back uh, into the Medicare program. Hi, Liz on. I see you yet. I'm going to introduce Liz Fowler. There she is. You, she's been introduced. So um, we're going to talk the two of us for uh, 10 minutes or so, and then uh, Mark and Dan are going to come join us. And I wanted to just start, um, I want to give Liz a chance to talk about some of her priorities and at CMMI and where they intersect with these kinds of efforts. Because um, I mean, one constant in years of um, efforts to fix healthcare has been the importance of primary care. It's been called different things over the years. I told Liz when we were prepping for this that the first time I heard the phrase advanced primary care, I thought it was for primary care for people with advanced illness. So um, it is actually the opposite is to try to give them great primary care so fewer of them will have advanced illness. Um, it's, but it's not a brand new concept. And some of what we've learned has been through Medicare ACO, through Medicare Advantage and Medicaid. So before we start talking about very briefly, if Liz could give a couple of sort of, what is some of the foundation that this kind of initiative can build on based what those public sector programs have learned through advanced primary care, which is sometimes called other things. Sure. Well, Joanne, I have a few remarks, if you don't mind, and if you'll indulge me just to talk a little bit about what CMS um, Innovation Center is doing. Um, but I really appreciate the chance to be here and, and of course, share a, a virtual stage with people that I um, know well and have um, very high regard and high respect for. So um, as many of you know, I arrived at the CMS Innovation Center about uh, just over six months ago, and we've been working on a strategy refresh, um, reflecting on what we've learned for the past decade and informing um, our direction for the next 10 years. And um, I really see my role as twofold. Um, and first is to provide as much clarity as possible about our strategy, not just the CMS Innovation Center, but um, helping to describe the administration as a whole strategy um, and future direction in the value-based care world. And then second, to work as hard as I can um, in partnership with the rest of the CMS leadership and with stakeholders that share our commitment to value-based care to really regain a sense of inevitability that our health system is moving away from fee-for-service. So in, I'm just gonna give you a nutshell um, version of our new strategy and why I think it's aligned with um, the direction that um, is described in the, in the Duke paper. Um, so you might've seen a blog that um, um, I co-authored along with CMS administrator, Chiquita brooks Lashur the head of Medicare, Dr. Mina Sishmani, and the head of Medicaid, uh, um, Dan Sai, um, in August. Um, it outlines a vision for a healthcare system, and that is a health system that achieves equitable outcomes through high quality, affordable person-centered care. And our strategy boils down to three primary areas of, areas of focus. And you'll see there's a lot of um, synergy with um, what's being discussed today. First is, um, advancing health equity, and that's one of the most important things we can focus on in the next 10 years, and a, a significant priority for the Biden-Harris administration. This means, as um, Dan described and as Mark described, um, equity is a central consideration um, in every part of our models, and I know as part of their work as well. And it also means collecting patient-level demographic and standardized social needs data. 
Um, second is driving accountable care. Again, another point of, um, of synergy. Um, a, one of our central goals is to increase the number of people in relationships with providers that are accountable for um, their patients' costs and improving their care. That means increasing the number of people, starting with Medicare, who are in an accountable care relationship with a provider accountable for their total cost of care and quality. Um, we're aiming to get 100% of Medicare beneficiaries into an accountable care relationship by 2030. And then the third is, and again, very relevant, um, partnering um, to achieve our goals. We've really placed a very high priority on partnerships. We need to work closely with um, commercial payers and purchasers, including um, employers, um, and as well as Medicaid agencies. And this multi-payer alignment approach includes clinical tools, outcome measures, payment, policy approaches. We really need to think about how to broaden our reach and impact um, to achieve system transformation. So that's in a nutshell where we're heading. I think from the Morgan um, Health perspective and the Duke White Paper, the key themes are of course, accountable provider re reimbursement to support care transformation and increased reliable on an advanced primary care and the emphasis on health equity. Um, Joanne, you asked what um, you asked about advanced primary care and, and to describe it. And I think the paper does a really good job of laying out that patient centered it's patient-centered care that's coordinated across providers and settings, um, most likely using a team-based approach. And at the heart, it's really focused on outcomes and results rather than revenue. So appropriate referrals to high-value specialists, um, eliminating low-value care, and the care is integrated, um, including wellness care, behavioral health, social supports. Um, so all of those things, I think, are common, common themes and um, things that we're all striving for. Can you um, give an example? I mean, one of the points in the paper um, in the partnerships was, you know, the healthcare people working in healthcare. One of the real changes is even before the COVID really sort of smacked everybody on the head with the equity issues, there had been a deepening discussion about social drivers of health, social determinants of health, and and one of the things in the paper mentioned was the need to further integrate to come up with community partnerships so that needs don't, the healthcare system and the social services systems are very siloed, you know, how do you create partnerships that, that create those bridges and get those needs met without necessarily the healthcare system in itself, you know, your primary care doctor is not going to go out and rent you an apartment. Um, can you give a couple of examples of either things that you know that you, where some of these partnerships or flexibilities are working or some direction that you want to go in? Well, first it's of all, part of your equity point that you made. Yeah, first, of, it's a great question. Um, and I know from CMMI's perspective, we've led um, one of the demonstrations we've led is called Accountable Health Communities, which really did seek to make those links between providers and community based organizations. It's possible. You can break down those barriers. So um, let me just say that it's it's not um, it's not an impossibility, but it takes a lot of work. Um, knowing where to refer patients, knowing where those resources sit, knowing how to how to connect patients and making sure that there's follow up. I think all of those are point, important points. And I guess the other thing I'll say is um, we have another demonstration on um, on um, value based insurance design for Medicare Advantage plans. And some of those plans are asking for more flexibility to be able um, to use um, um, to access those services and supports and um, and for, for Medicare to allow them to be considered um, supplemental benefits. So I, I think we're at the verge of, of more of that happening, but really probably at the nascent state stage. Um, but I think those, it is possible. Uh, Mark and uh, Dan wanted to come in and join the conversation around now so we can bring them in. Mark. Okay. Um, what are the, what are the, um, what are the, the essential tools for doing this kind of accountable care or advanced primary care is data, which is something that we're still not great at, right? I mean, the pandemic has been um, among the many, many, many things that went wrong. You know, we just, we're not data prepared. We're, um, what are some of the, um, and if you're a small primary care practice, I mean, the paper makes clear that you're going to have to partner and you're going to, you know, little tiny, that's why they're starting with a big sophisticated one. They're not starting with two little doctors right. in some small town. Um, 
Are some of the tools that the public health plans have developed with data, how much of that is transferable? How much is, or copyable? That's not exactly a word, but you all know what I mean. I mean, how much, how much can we just sort of jump and say, okay, I'm, uh, here's how I can get those kinds of systems and data and insights that I need. I don't know who wants to sort of take that. Um, Dan wants to start or Liz say, here's what we share. Or Dan, here's what we need. Dan, do you want to start? Sure, I'm happy to start on that first. Um, Joanne, you're exactly right, which is that um, to, to successfully deploy this model, you have to have sophistication around data. We cannot pay on the basis of quality without being able to measure quality on a real-time basis. And one of the reasons why we've chosen to, to uh, engage in Columbus, we have 38,000 employees and dependents there, uh, but it's also because of Central Ohio Primary Care, and they've been doing uh, full risk capitation in the Medicare program uh, through the Agilon uh, company for quite some time. So they already have a high level of data sophistication. Um, personally, I believe that this style of medicine where there's a leveraged primary care model, um, you're really going to need a, a kind of more concentration and a sophistication. That means it's going to be very hard to practice, I think, as a solo practitioner in that model. Um, and that's something that we kind of will accept going forward. But I, from, from the, um, and in terms of the question about, about Medicare and Medicaid, there are definitely some analogies there. Um, with that said, uh, providing insurance to a, in, in a, an employed population is different. There are different needs. Uh, age is obviously different. Um, there, there are uh, kind of different issues that are faced by by the uh, insured population. And so, you know, we're, we're looking to partner with um, CMMI to kind of engage in this, but we're also going to be very cognizant of the differences. Yeah, I'll just add that, that whether it's, it's data or the team-based approach to care or the coordination with uh, especially care, behavioral health, et cetera, all of these are not easy capabilities for any primary care practice to manage, especially as some of the, the, the comments and questions have pointed out, uh, payment rates for, for primary care have historically been really low and only a small part of our overall healthcare expenditures. So that's why this uh, partnership approach, uh, one that includes uh, bringing in organizations with some experience in this effort, really helps. Although this is not the typical way of delivering care, there are a growing number of examples around the country, and we talk about many of them in the report. Support. Uh, some in the commercial side, more probably in Medicare Advantage and some of the advanced uh, uh, Medicare ACOs and some even in, in Medicaid programs that, as Dan said, are treating somewhat different populations, but have already made this big step at some scale uh, to this different model of care delivery that is not fee-for-service based and that involves attention and accountability to things like patient health outcomes and progress on equity and social drivers uh, uh, and the like. So so there isn't yet uh, what we'd like to see in terms of a critical mass to do this, uh, but with efforts like Morgan Health and Morgan Health's willingness to share their experience and tools uh, with efforts like uh, those going on at PBGH and other employers that are committed to similar goals, and very importantly, with the leadership from CMS that Liz Fowler and her colleagues are providing, it does seem like there's an opportunity to really accelerate progress. Liz, how does... Um... Well, for, for all three of you, but start with us. I mean, um, one of the issue, another issue brought up in the in the in the paper was engagement, patient engagement, making people want to be in a situation like this, get their care this way, understand and, and be able to visualize and, and really understand the benefit to them and their health. Their experience of care is supposed to be better. Um, I, I guess some employees, some employers might just say, "This is what we're doing, and you're all doing it," and others are, are going to gives, um, you would see a, judging from the fact that you talked about this as an issue, I imagine you see some of it's gonna be voluntary and you, you need to draw patients in. Um, again, how, I mean, in, 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 you know, if you're in a, a Medicare ACO, you as a patient don't know that. If you're going into a Medicare Advantage plan, you're making that choice usually. Um, if you're in an MCO, again, you're not, th these are things you're put in. But what do we know about um, how, and people might be attached to their doctor. I mean, their doctor may be a great clinician who's not doing advanced, doing 1950s primary care, but they feel comfortable, they feel taken care of, they feel like they're getting good care whether they are or not. Uh, and they might be, they might be getting great care from the doctor who's known them for 25 years. How do you make that transition? I mean, if 
Um, I mean, I guess let's start with Dan and then see if Liz has any insights into how she's thinking about that in the government programs and then Mark. So we plan to feel this as an optional model. So uh, no one is gonna be forced into this. And the idea is that that if they see value in it, which they should, um, or hopefully they will, um, they will they will opt into it. Uh, right now, about 25% of our uh, employees are being cared for by Central Ohio Primary Care. And for them, it's just an ad. Um, then we have about 25% who are engaged with a uh, primary care physician elsewhere, and we'll make them aware of it. But if they decide they want to stay in the traditional fee-for-service world, that's okay. Um, and then we have about 50%, which is actually very similar to national norms, that are really not connected to a primary care physician at all. And there's a real opportunity there to help uh, our employees get engaged, because we, one thing that we do know is that that um, if a pay, if a if a uh, an employee is engaged with a primary care physician, they're going to get better care. Liz, any insights from what the public programs have learned in terms of, I mean, there's there's the pa patients are sometimes distrustful of an employer, right? Oh, they wanted me to give up my doctor and go to this. They're taking, you know, it can be seen as a negative if it's not handled right, if it's not, um, not just message, but a genuine education. Um, are there lessons learned or examples or things you want to do to draw more people in, in the public programs to um, to get these kind of benefits. I mean, the, the, like, you know, we all heard during the pandemic, we've all heard all these, you know, we've all been at meetings and webinars about vaccine hesitancy where somebody says, well, they should just talk to their doctor. And I always wanted, you know, you're often on mute and those things. And I always want to sort of wave and scream, they don't have a doctor. So um, how do you get people even to understand that need and that access and that opportunity uh, before you even go to the advanced model? Well, it's a really good question. And I think beneficiary choice is such a mantra in Medicare. It's hard to see anything that's gonna be mandatory in Medicare either. So I can't, as much as we, we have a goal of moving 100% of um, beneficiaries into some sort of accountable care arrangement, whether that be um, an ACO um, or the newest version of an ACO, the direct contracting model, advanced primary care or um, Medicare Advantage. So we, our goal is to get everyone in, into that system um, you know, a lot of times people choose Medicare Advantage because of the extra benefits or lower premiums. Um, so it's a choice, an economic choice. Um, potentially they, they get something out of it that they don't have if they didn't have, for example, Medigap or supplemental coverage um, and the convenience of getting everything all in one. Um, but like you said, people aren't necessarily, they may not even know that they're in an ACO. And I'm, I'm not sure how to ch change that, but we are looking at, you know, is there the ability for some of these organizations to um, provide the same sort of extra benefits and extra services that, that you might see from a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, but I would say also we can learn from employers in terms of motivating better, um, better health choices and, and some of the behavioral um, aspects of, of wellness care. Um, having worked in the private sector, you know, sometimes those financial incentives for filling out um, a wellness survey or, you know, a, a bonus for getting a vaccine, for example, my employer, my employer sponsored uh, plan just sent me, I can get $50 if I go get the vaccine, those sorts of, there's probably things we can learn um, from the employer sector as well. Um, so I think there's maybe some mutual learnings. I want to go back to one thing, and I know I've got to jump and you've got to go on, but, you know, the previous uh, question you asked, um, it's in our interest to build capacity as well among the primary care um, um, practices. And so deploying those tools, helping build those support systems and data analytic capabilities, like that's in our interest and it's in the interest of employers. And so I hope that that's something where we have a shared goal and, and we can look at, at um, approaches to help build that capacity. So, you know, there can be more spread and scale to what, um, what Morgan Health is looking at and and the and the types of solutions that um, Mark outlined in the in the paper. Yeah, you know we appreciate that, Liz, and we're excited to work with you. And I think that in in many areas, so for example, the definition of of um, health equity and how do we measure and incent uh, reductions in health disparities are these are places where a governmental uh, there's a strong governmental interest, and and we're excited to be working with you there as well. Same. And before we let Liz go, I should just say that I came up with like a big project I wanted to write about this year. And like, 
Liz came up with almost the same thing, Patrick, that she wants the whole, whatever the budget just of reading Medicare. your mind, Joanne. Yeah. I'm just reading your mind. So, so we, we go back a lot of years, so we will be talking in the future. Thank you yeah. um, to uh, Liz Thanks, for making Liz. time today. And now we're going to have Elizabeth Carpenter um, from Avalier join us. Is she on? I am. Hi. Okay. I guess this isn't the time for me to ask you whether the second child was a boy or a girl, but I'll get that one later. <laughs> It was a girl. Her name is Abigail and she's great. Thanks, Joanne. Um, <laughs> great. <laughs> we all see uh, all world. Um, let's talk a little bit about what you know, you're at Avalier. Um, you're doing things all across the country. This is one of yeah. many projects you've been working on to try to improve healthcare. Where does your effort, what do you, what do you, when you, when you look at this idea, this push for advanced primary care, you know, what does it tell you about where we are? And then what are you and your organization doing to promote and further it? Yeah, that's perfect. So, you know, the first thing I would say is that at Avalier, you know, as many of you know, we work with customers across what we would call our 360 degree perspective. So we work with health plans, providers, bio pharmaceutical companies, patient groups, and employers. And I think when, you know, I look at the employer market, like all of those stakeholders, um, you know, we really see that employers are trying to unlock the power of the consumer, right, and engage their employees on two fronts. One, to drive sort of more tailored, value-based, efficient care. And on the other, you know, really just to engage their employees in something that matters to them, right? We are in a highly competitive uh, environment as it relates to the workforce. And and making sort of primary care and navigating our complicated healthcare system is a way that employers can actually add value. Um, so that would sort of be, you know, the, some of my high level thoughts. I mean, I've thought about this issue, Joanne, and I think, um, you know, we think about this issue against sort of this very dynamic external environment we're in, whether it be COVID or the policy environment or the health equity debate. And I think there are a few data points that are worth talking about, right? So on the, the COVID front, obviously we know COVID has affected people who've had COVID, families, members, et cetera. Um, but we also know it's really disrupted sort of day-to-day -day care. And some of our data shows, you know, that um, colonoscopy rates, for example, are still 55% below what they were in 2019, pre-pandemic, right? And at the same time, we know that all of us have engaged in the healthcare system using technology in, in new and different ways. We kind of got a kick in the butt, and I mean that in a good way, right? And so when you combine those couple of things and you think about sort of advanced primary care and the employer imperative, right, there's an opportunity. We know that employees need to sort of be re-engaged in the healthcare system. Um, and at the same time, we know that, you know, they may be more comfortable doing it using technology. And so, you know, that feels like a, a sort of perfect storm in some ways to insert this, this type of solution. You know, as we think about sort of the evolving policy environment and sort of Mark um, mentioned Medicare Advantage, for example, you know, our data shows that Medicare Advantage plans invest 29% more in primary care than, than fee-for-service would and sort of similar uh, beneficiaries but are paying a whole lot less as it relates to inpatient hospitalizations, et cetera. And so, you know, obviously different population. And I think, you know, Dan was um, very uh, clear about that, but, but, you know, some, some proof of concept there. And, you know, I think the other thing just to think about certainly worth thinking about as it relates to sort of CMMI and certainly there's partnership opportunities there for employers, but, there's also opportunities for employers to do their own experiments, <laughs> right? And, and, and find a way to sort of collect the data to, to sort of demonstrate ROI in new ways, right? I think we know anecdotally better primary care is good, but we could use some more data. Like, like what do we really need to do and, and for what populations? And then finally, I would just say, as it relates to, to health equity, right? Our data has shown that in 2020, mortality rates among, among Medicare beneficiaries who are racial and ethnic minorities are one and a half to three times that of their white counterparts, right? And again, different population, but certainly, you know, that data says, okay, these are people who had access to, you know, roughly the same coverage, the same benefits, and we're still seeing that disparity. And so there's no reason to believe that there aren't disparities within employer groups, right? And within, within employees. 
And as employers increasingly focus on you know, more diverse and equitable and inclusive workplaces, there's also a question about how they're gonna use their health plans um, to drive not just equitable benefits um, or equal benefits, but equitable benefits. And that may mean programs that allow employees really to sort of tailor their healthcare and navigate the healthcare system in a way that works for them. Um, and certainly, you know, everything I know about sort of the advanced primary care model suggests that there's opportunity there as well. So um, those are certainly some of the things I think that we're thinking about at Avalier, um, you know, very consistent with a number of things that, that Mark and Dan raised, but I will um, stop and sort of look forward to more conversation. Um, let's broaden out now, bring everybody back in. Dan, put your video back on. Um, one of the issues is, I mean, we, we our system is very, uh, it is not oriented toward primary care. It is oriented toward specialty care. It's we, one of the, we're, we're fee-for-service, but we're also proceduralist specialist oriented. We pay more to specialists. We emphasize specialty care. Um, this is a change. This is an attempt to rebalance that. Um, but at some point you also need specialty care. So how do you, as, as we, let's just for the sake of the next two minutes, assume that advanced primary care just takes off. It's everything that Dan and you all want it to be. Um, how does that change the relationship with the specialist and the specialty care? Maybe I could start with that one and appreciate uh, uh, Dan and, uh, uh, and Elizabeth's perspectives too in the, in the Morgan Health and, and more general employer context. Um, it does mean a different relationship. And it's not to say that, that specialists aren't a key part of delivering uh, coordinated care. They absolutely are. Um, but this is a different relationship, one in which the primary care providers could pl play an active role in helping an individual establish a good relationship with a specialist and sharing data, back to your point, uh, earlier. And in the good examples of these kinds of models, we also see a lot of interest from specialists in moving to different kinds of care models as well. You know, many of their payments are tied to performing specific procedures, dealing with specific complications, um, you know, in person rather than really being part of a coordinated care team. So whether it's cardiovascular care, musculoskeletal care, um, diabetes care, uh, a different approach to specialized care where the specialist could get support for uh, maybe curbside uh, virtual consults for the primary care practice, uh, more support for ongoing management of, say, patients with uh, musculoskeletal disorders, uh, back pain, degenerative joint disease uh, to support alternatives to surgery that can lead to better functional outcomes and lower costs. Um, all of those are also big opportunities for improving care. So by no means is the change in primary care payment support the only change that'll get to comprehensive care, but it is a really critical foundation to work with a new kind of relationship with specialists. And you know we've seen a lot of efforts to in, uh, change the way that specialists are paid, moving to bundled payments for procedures, I think what we'll hopefully see coming out of this is um, uh, changes in the way that specialists can work with primary care doctors and get supported for what they think is most important for a patient's specialized care needs. So obviously, it's a, a lot of health care. Uh, that should be a way to bring down total costs, uh, help uh, all providers, primary care docs and specialists, uh, practice more at the top of their game and in a way that optimizes health outcomes for their patients. Uh, if uh, For those who are interested, there's a little bit in this paper about the coordination with um, specialized care. We had another report that uh, Duke Margolis released back in June that uh, lays out a bit more comprehensively how primary and specialized care can work together in these models. And uh, hopefully our team can put up a link to that report as well. Uh, there's a lot of other work going on around how to make primary specialty care work together in this comprehensive care approach. And is that the experience that's unfolding in Columbus or is there resistance? Is there um, I mean, it's, it, it, you can see a scenario that Mark just described where there's a new relationship and the, the specialist gets to do what they train to do and um, have a great relationship with this coordinated approach with the primary care. And there's another scenario you can see, you know, that's a, there are more cutthroat scenarios you can envision where they don't want the primary care intruding on their turf. You know, they are the expert and they get paid for being the expert. So what are you, what are you seeing 
Um, and this is a community that's already, the, the, the model's already matured somewhat there. So what bumps have been overcome because presumably you're making progress or you wouldn't be doing it in Columbus. Yeah, so first um, I loved Mark's answer. It was exactly the way that we envision it. Um, note that we will start this model on 1-1-22. So that's kind of when we go, go live with it. Um, based on the Agilon experience, the relationships with the specialists are good. Um, you know, it's not to say that there aren't going to be sometimes points of friction, but generally uh, the relationships are really good. I would like to come back though to something that Mark alluded to, which is really central to our model, which is putting the patient in the center of the decision-making and care navigation is really important for us, you know, because right now, even with all good intentions of our carriers, um, our employees don't know when they're going to get a colonoscopy or whatever routine procedure. They don't know the costs associated with the procedure and they don't know the quality. And um, they need more steerage. They need more suggestions. It doesn't have to be a binding uh, commitment. It just has to be the information that they need. And patients have a terrible time figuring out which doctors to go to, which specialists to go to even, um, because they're just not getting the information and they're not being uh, helped in that navigation. And I'll say that, you know, one of the, one of the attractive things about doing this in Columbus for us is that, is that uh, it's a big call center operation. So these are not, in, you know, Wall Street investment bankers. Uh, they are people who need to be at their desks and doing their jobs. And they don't have time to take time off to try to, you know, mess around with with uh, calling their friends and neighbors and relatives and consulting Google. They need to have good advice uh, as to how to navigate the healthcare system. So that's another aspect of what we're trying to accomplish here, which is really to, to democratize that aspect of the, um, of the care management process. Yeah, and Dan, you know, I think that's really interesting. It's something that we've been thinking a lot about, right? The past decade or so, there's been so much focus on network design and network management and you know, not to say that that's gonna go away, right? But this is sort of in this age of technology and engaging the patient and the consumer, mm -hmm. right? This is a, a new way to think about how to sort of manage and um, you know, sort of help people navigate yeah. the healthcare system as opposed to just saying, okay, these doctors are in and these doctors are out. We're looking at a lot of uh, the care navigation companies right now as part of a separate work stream. And what most of them are doing, which I find really interesting, is it's really applying the search principles to care navigation. So if when, when you're being um, advised on who the primary doctors are, and the first three doctors that come up are generally the ones you're going to click on as opposed to the ones further down. And so if there's good um, thinking and algorithms going into the selection of those first three, there's a lot of steerage of patients that will happen just as a result of that initial suggestion. But there's also, there's been a lot of sort of bright, shiny objects in patient engagement um, that haven't worked that, you know, people put up these quality tools and these so first of all, you need a certain amount of digital sophistication to even start it. Um, but a lot of these tools, and I haven't looked at this data since before the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's changed, but at least as of late 2019, early 2020, they really were falling short. So um, where that was, was that was too much interacting with the screen and here you're adding more of a human component because you have a care navigator or is the care navigator a tool or is it both? Uh, we're we're going to be doing both, um, so it's not it's not going to be relying strictly on the on the digital on the digital piece. And Joanne, your point about things not working is definitely true. Yeah, and we'd all be unemployed and you know, happily very, on a beach somewhere if things worked. We, <laughs> I mean, we kind of we go into this with humility. Um, with that said, we are also not free to desist from trying to improve things for the 285,000 employees and dependents that rely on us. And so it's really a matter of navigating it. And we're gonna be very open about what we find and um, try to do the best we can and, and um, make sure that this serves as a basis for models that will improve over time. Yeah, Joanne, I think you're so right that every customer that I have asked, how do I better engage a healthcare consumer, right? Everyone. Uh, and, you know, it, it will be interesting to see sort of how the pandemic may have shifted how, you know, consumers of healthcare use technology, how we can leverage data and the like. But this is where, you know, personally, 
I think that there's so much opportunity in the employer community as all of these new technologies come to market, right? And, and vendors are going to Dan and other employers and saying, hey, we can do X or Y, but don't really have a lot of proof <laughs> in terms of you know, how something might actually work in the real world. And it seems to me that employers um, present a really nice opportunity to test some of these new technologies and sort of care models and, and see if they work and disseminate those findings, you know, not just for other commercial entities, but you know, public ones as well. I think some of the tech tools are also generational, but they'll become more common because people who are doing everything online are, are more comfortable finding a doctor, booking an appointment, et cetera, online. Um, two, two questions that have come up, I've been working in some of the questions, but several people asked about dental care. We've mentioned, you, um, both of you mentioned, all three of you, I think, have mentioned behavioral, integrating behavioral into primary care, which is, again, something that we've addressed as a need, we've started on and we're not there at all. This model would, would allow you to do that, but we've had several questions about um, dental. Um, is that part? Is it part of primary care? Shouldn't it be part of primary care? Is it part of the models that you're looking at, or are our teeth still somewhere out on a different healthcare island, and our gums? So, so unlike Medicare, JPMC actually does have a dental benefit, um, and uh, the, I, I one thing you and Bernie and you can agree on, right? <laughs> we haven't yet decided in terms of kind of how how it is going to be integrated, but that's a good question. It is a good question. It is, um, this is another area where, again, learning from employers may be helpful. I know there are a number of proposals out there about um, adding uh, dental benefits to Medicare, but still some debate about how to do that in a way that's most effective and, um, and most efficient. And since employers are already providing both, it does uh, open up some opportunities to, uh, to get to more integrated care. And, and Dan, I would, I'd expect at least to the extent, um, you know, it is in a limited way for those employees who are having health issues that are complicated by their dental disease or more isolated or otherwise because of dental problems, this kind of that care navigation and coordination yeah. you talked about should be a big help. Yeah. Yeah. A question about um, paying. If if this model is that a self-insured employer is paying a per month a per patient per month fee, um, for care that some of which you're going to be you're going to eliminate. Mm -hmm. You're going to show it's not needed. It's low value. We don't need to do it. We can come up with a better approach. We're going to catch it here so we don't have to pay for it down the road there. Um, are they going to, I mean, why should they keep paying those rates if you, for care that you've managed to squeeze out and squeeze out in a positive, yeah. disruptive way? You didn't need that. You're, we're giving you something better. But does it's it? Great. This, is, this is a great question. So we like, you know, why, why do you pay a premium for anything? It's because there's value that is being created. And you know, if if this model creates value, then employers should be very happy to to um, kind of engage engage in that. Um, and if it doesn't, then no, it's not going to last. So I, I feel like I feel like it's a very good question. It's elemental. It's certainly something we're going to be studying really closely over time. But again, you know, this is going to take time to prove out. Um, this is a probably a five year. If you know, we we kind of one thing we do learn from. Medicare, uh, and we're, we're uh, very fortunate to have actually um, Don Alley joined us over at, um, at Morgan Health, who, who was the chief strategy officer of CMMI. And these timelines, these evaluation timelines are five-year timelines. And we don't expect to have you know, definitive answers to a lot of these questions uh, until we actually have the data to support it. Um, how much um, did you pre-engage the patient? How much did you um, as you've working toward this model before you present, before you made it public, um, these patients who you want to engage, did you, or were they part of the design? Were they part of, did they give pre-feedback? This is yeah, what I'm looking for. This is what's gonna make me give up that primary care solo practitioner to do this integrated program. Or was it, you know, I don't wanna to use top down because it's, very, it's a pejorative phrase, but you know, just who did you talk to? And we're doing a lot you know, of that right now. And Vera, our partner, has you know a a twenty year history in this space and came with a lot of knowledge about about you know employee preferences and and the like. Okay. Um, if I could just add something on this point, there's a there are a couple of other questions in the um, 
chat about uh, direct primary care and, you know, do you really even need an employer at all? Um, one reason I think that employers are really helpful, especially employers like, J, uh, like JP Morgan, Chase, they have a diversity of employees. Some are better situated financially than others. Some very high wage workers, but a lot of service workers who, you know, have really been struggling um, as a whole, not necessarily Morgan, JP Morgan's in particular, um, but having an ability to help in, uh, engage uh, those employees through outreach and efforts that are really hard for a primary care practice to do on their own is so important, especially for um, employees who are coming from maybe uh, less uh, well-off backgrounds, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, where we've seen such big disparities emerge in the pandemic. And I appreciate the, uh, the Morgan Health commitment to bring a focus on, on equity and engaging the diversity uh, of, of employees, get them all in the same kind of uh, uh, healthcare program, regardless of wages or, or, or service uh, um, you know, or, or type of job and the like, be a very important step to engaging everyone uh, in these kinds of models. How much, um, I mean, what employers have done in the last couple of years to bring down costs is to shift the cost to, to, the, to the, the worker and the family so that co-pays have gone up and deductibles gone up, <laughs> premiums have gone up. I mean, so that the cost of care got shifted rather than reduced. You're trying to go back to models in which you reduce, both, both specifically what, what JP Morgan is doing and what Mark and, and Elizabeth are doing in their respective worlds of coming up with a healthcare system or moving toward a healthcare system that does reward quality and gives you value. Um, but it, how much fatigue, I mean, We've seen a lot of initiatives. They, they've, I mean, I've, I've known all of you for years. I think all of us thought some things along the way were going to work, and they didn't. Mm -hmm. um, this may be, you know, you know, you, Morgan. This is a big venture. You have, mm -hmm. you have a lot of confidence in it. Or they wouldn't be doing it. But how much is that a barrier? Just like, oh, here we go again. Look, you know, um, what I would say is that there is a growing level of frustration uh, by American employers at rising costs and lack of accountability for outcomes. And I think the events of the last couple of years as, as um, the cognizance of, of uh, racial disparities has increased, that has only exacerbated that frustration. Um, to think that, that you, know, you as an employer are part of a system that results in substandard care um, for groups of your employee base is not only frustrating, it's completely unacceptable. And so, you know, I will say that, that I think this is a, a really opportune moment to be focused on this. The issue is that employers have not been offered an alternative to the standard indemnity models. And that is, that is basically the problem. I mean, you know, in some areas, like in Southern California, where you can give Kaiser as an option, employees at least have an option for an accountable care model that, that, um, that exists. But then in many, case, in many uh, geographies in the country, including most of the places where, where we have high concentrations of employees, that model just doesn't exist. And so you end up with, with really no choice uh, at all. And I think that, that um, what we're doing is really an effort to create optionality for employers that, that uh, wanna do something different from the standard model. If I yeah, may say add to that, um, we, we had in the- We're in running the out of time. So unless you wanna okay. go over, Mark, we should- Okay, no, go, to wrap up. go on. Tell this me if you wanna go over. We have that in the report. And this is, to, to Dan's point, it, this is a big change in contracting. It's something employers had a really hard time to do on an individual basis with uh, particular health plans. But with the scale that's happening now across multiple employers and CMS, it does feel like it's a different time to implement these bigger changes. Um, I want to get one last question in, and I'll, I'll, Elizabeth will give you a start at it. Um, how we've been talking employers sort of generically. One of the biggest employers and an employer that could really use their marketing clout because they have it is the public sector, right? State mm -hmm. employees, state employee health plans are big. Um, what and, and they they have influence and they have they're huge, um, and they have some freedom. <laughs> how well? Subways they do. So, what, what, how does this kind of model could it be attractive to state governments and to public employees themselves? Who wants yeah. to? Yeah. I mean, I, I did in a prior life some work with a state employee plan who was thinking about sort of new and innovative ways, right? There's no, um, there's no secret that uh, employee healthcare is a big expense for states. 
you know, I think that the challenge there is, you know, some of the legacy expectations around things like choice and cost sharing. And, you know, I suspect that um, some states who can work really closely with unions and other sort of employee leaders could come up with some really innovative solutions. Joanne, you know, to your point, though, I think that um, those conversations need to have a lot of free discussion with the member population in order to mm -hmm. sort of be implemented successfully. And, you know, just because I can't resist on sort of the previous conversation, you know, something that I think is different today as we think about sort of decision making and, and this prior trend of sort of exposing individuals to more system costs as a way to drive decision making is that, you know, People have $4,000 deductibles and no real information on how to make a good care decision, right? And so part of this is that there's more transparency and care navigation tools and the like. Um, you know, maybe some of the what people wanted out of that benefit design could be realized in other ways. So um, mm -hmm. lots of lots of stuff to think about there. So Joanne, yeah. here, here, I love that question. We are hearing from many state employee groups um, asking us about our model and we are spending time with them, helping them understand what we're doing and why. And they're hungry for this as an, uh, and to kind of some of the points that Elizabeth is making as an optional model that gives employees uh, an understanding of who the providers are and gives some optionality and also enables more of a team-based approach to primary care because they're just not getting that right now. And so if it's an ad and it's a positive uh, and it's optional, then there, there is interest in these kinds of models. And I think, I think there's gonna be increasing um, motion of these public employee plans over into these accountable care models over time. I think it's been a sort of underappreciated resource in terms of really creating large, if done right and if it works, to, to, yeah. There are a lot of people in the public sector. No, you're right. I mean, um, we're, we're the largest- States can commercial. be much more active in reshaping their markets, right? We're the largest um, okay. commercial employer in Columbus, but the largest employer is the state. Right. Um, and the largest employer in many counties is the hospital, which is a whole other set of issues. Um, all right, we, we just need to wrap up. Elizabeth, what's your takeaway? My takeaway is that we are in a unique moment when you sort of combine the confluence of technology and data and engaging the consumer and, you know, it would be naive to say that all of this is just going to work right away, but it does feel like there are some better factors at play than there were maybe 10 years ago to make some of this successful. Dan, you're, you're confident. Um, what's your takeaway? You yeah, took the I, job I, to do this, right? Um, look, we're going down this path. We need great partners and we go into it with a lot of humility and, um, and are looking for you know, partnership, not only in terms, you see partnership, it's like my partner over here who just climbed onto the chair in back of me. But um, we're looking for partnership from a range of different stakeholders and, and eager to work uh, collaboratively. And before I turn to Mark to wrap us up, um, there were really, I, I got a lot of questions in. This was a really smart audience with really great questions. Um, I couldn't get all of them in, but I, I sort of got a sampling. So thank you for your engagement because we could we could actually spend another hour talking about these audience questions, but we don't have it. So Mark. Michael, I wanted to hear your takeaway, Joanne. Um, I guess I, like I read this, Really, frankly, I read it and thought, I read it twice. The first time I read it, I was tired. The second, <laughs> the second time I read it, I said, this makes a lot of sense. But then I also thought, you know, I've thought that before, right? I've seen, I've, I've known, we've all known each other for, I mean, I worked with Elizabeth, which is why I was able to be friendly with her at the beginning. Um, the, the, you know, we, we've seen a lot of promising things that we think are a solution not work in the real world. So, you know, we'll come back in a year or a year and a half. I mean, could this work on paper? It sure as hell could, right? I mean, you've incorporated a lot of the lessons. You've incorporated, we, we, we need this teamwork. We need to integrate this. We need to integrate that. We need to keep equity. We need to listen to people. We need to give tools that work. I mean, I thought you hit all, but also the slide that Mark started, the to-do list is pretty intimidating. A lot right? of work. Yeah. A lot well, of work. Um, so Dan, Elizabeth, are you guys up for that? Back together in a year, year and a half and uh, and see where we are. Um, in, in all seriousness, this, this is- In, in real life, maybe. Oh, I was going to say, hopefully it's not on Zoom. 
<laughs> That's right. In real life, this is a big lift. But for all the reasons we've talked about today and in the report, uh, there seems to be more momentum, more actual how to, uh, more actual activity and implementing it uh, than I've ever seen before. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but I really want to thank um, uh, Joanne Yu for, for moderating today, Liz Fowler for taking time out of a very busy schedule where she's spending most of the rest of her day making this real, uh, to, to Joanne's point. Um, and uh, uh, Dan and the, the team at, uh, at Morgan Health for the collaboration on this, not just to go do it, but to talk about it, uh, to be a bit public about it, and to help create uh, that kind of uh, momentum and critical mass that's needed for transformation. Uh, final special thanks to the team at uh, Duke Margolis that helped out with all of this, Mark Japinga, Michael Zhu, uh, uh, Rob Saunders, and, and others. Um, and uh, to all of you who joined us today, a lot of really good questions. I know a lot of people there who are out there tr struggling with these same issues and, and trying to make progress. We hope to see you again st soon. Stay tuned to our work and, uh, and Morgan Health as we keep uh, on this journey to, to healthcare transformation. Take care and enjoy the rest of the day.